Dear students, welcome to EPG Patshala. Myself, Dr. Snigda Vishnoi from University of Hyderabad. I welcome all of you to the chapter to the module on women and social reform movements in colonial India, written by Dr. Archana Verma. This is a course which happens to be a portion and a part and parcel of women and history. So let us begin with giving us a brief snapshot of what exactly are we going to learn in this module. We are going not to be learning just about all of these reform movements from the perspective of their leaders, but by the qualities, by how all of these reform movements can be understood in the background of their basic elements, their driving force, which could be running behind the caste system, the Brahmin Samaj, the reform as a critique or as a response to the colonial critique given on to these women position and to our Indian society. We will also be learning how these different reform movements are spanned across the geography of India along with some important matters. Beginning with the same, the late 19th and early 20th centuries as we see were a period of social reform period in India. Many of these reform movements originated as I told you in response towards the European critique of the Indian society as backward, uncivilized as compared to the enlightened European societies as they were originally considered to be. This was really a design to validate and continue the European imperialism in India as the white man's responsibility to civilize and to civilize the uncivilized world which was conceptualized not just limited to India but to all the other countries such as Africa and several other Asian nations. This was of course as I understand that India because it showed a strong will and enterprise in responding to this particular critique and emphasizing that the potential to not limit us to these kind of taglines is something that the Indian scholars or Indian reform leaders were not happy about. So we moved on to the modern ideas. We moved on to prove the basic ideas that we had in our Indian civilization. And for that matter, in our own leaders, we went across the nations, we went across the societies in order to explain the basic essence and the concept of leadership behind our societies. So our history was not as backward as it was thought by the European European critique has the European scholars had made out to be. In the following context, we will of course explore some of the major reform movements of the period and particularly with their focus on the impact on women. Beginning with the Arya Samaj, which was a Vedic movement founded by Swami Dayanand Saraswati from Kathiawad in Gujarat. It was officially established on 7th of April 1875 in Bombay. Prior to this, he established Vedic schools or Gurukul between 1869 and 1873 in Farukhabad, Mirzapur, Kasganj, Aligarh and Varanasi. These schools ran on the model of traditional ancient Gurukuls and revolved around the learning and imbibing the values of the Vedas. However, they did not get the continuous financial support, enough teachers and of course there was a constant paucity of textbooks that was not being made available to the concerned people. We could also understand Dayanand Saraswati movements in terms of the overall idea behind his particular reformist ideas. He wanted to reform the entire educational system in order to be favoring women, in order to empowering women so that they could come across as informed as well as powerful individuals. He realized that such educational attempts had to be based on public support in order to continue for a long time. In order to sustain his ideas, he went across the nation and across the societies to propagate his ideals, to propagate his values, to make people understand the value behind all of this movement and he encouraged women across the societies to adopt some of the values and the reformist ideas. And 
to the center of his philosophy was the Vedic ideology. We should not be surprised when he was trying to propagate his idea of Vedic education. Dayanand traveled, as I told you, across the India around the time period of 1872 and 73. He met other social reformers of all his times and could share his ideas without any hesitation. He was particularly in constantly in touch with the reformers of Brahmo Samaj in Bengal which he thought would be an important point for all of a particular geographical point to disseminate his ideas further. In 1874, he gave a series of Light of Truth lectures which were published under the title Satyarth Prakash. Having generated a lot of support for his educational ideas, he founded the new Arya Samaj. This was of course not just an educational institution but a social movement including emphasis on Vedic education among all other issues it dealt with. So his reform ideas were certainly focused on education but certainly not limited to education but again towards the empowerment and to the further enlightenment of the society. Arya Samaj accepted the priority of the Vedas but certainly of course was not limited to expansion of their particular ideas to the modernizing ideas as well. Thus there was an opinion, thus there was a movement where it could imbibe both the elements of westernized ideas as well as the Vedic ideas into a combined system bringing assertive reforms into our society. These reform movements were of course centered on women, hence again I would like to reiterate not limited to the women. So they as told before, they accepted the priority of the Vedas and propagated the adoption of Vedic worldview as a result of Vedic education. According to his worldview, Bayan and Saraswati propagated women's education, giving respect to women, their space in family decisions, opposed child marriage of girls and various other rights that were engaged in that were engaging women in the limited ideas or limited worldview. He advocated extending the Vedic education amongst the non-Brahmical caste as well, including the scheduled castes. For this, he engaged in debates with the traditional priests and defeated them in debates. This was one constant dialogue that he wanted to maintain across the particular caste groups so, is so that his ideas could be accepted and his ideas could be propagated by a number of caste groups or the across the social structure of Indian society. Then Saraswati died in 1884. And after him, Arya Samaj acquired widespread influence mainly in Punjab and retains a large following in Punjab, Delhi, Haryana and Western UP till day. Lala Hansraj and Swami Shraddhanand Saraswati were two of his main successors in this region. Why this geographical in discussion is important? Because we need to understand all of these reform movements in the regions. Of course, they propagated their ideas first into to the idea of geographic distance that they could follow and of course with how much expansion of their ideas and how much popularity of their ideas were received while traveling across this journey. Lala Hansaraj founded the first Dayanand Anglo-Vedic school in 1886 in Lahore with the fellow R. Samaji Gurudat Vidyarthi. This grew into DAV college later and many branches of DAV schools and colleges were established in the northwestern part of the subcontinent. As I have discussed before, this particular reform movement was not limited to the limited expansion or the rem targeted reform ideas were not really inspired, not limited to the inspiration from the Vedic ideology. This movement propagated accepting English and Western education along with Vedic education as a part of modernization of society. In this very particular sense, it had a pretty modern approach towards society in general, particularly keeping women in center. It did not stop at merely imparting Vedic knowledge to the people, but also opened up the new horizons of the possibility of modernizing the society without compromising on the Vedic ideology or the roots that we belonged to. 
In 1893, a section of the followers of the Arya Samaj separated it from under the leadership of Swami Shraddhanand Saraswati and his associate Pandit Lekram. This was a more traditionalist group as opposed to the English and the westernization of education system. They wanted to remain rooted in the Vedic education only. They called their wing as Punjab Arya Samaj and led Punjab Arya Pratinidhi Sabha. This also happens to be the place from where the ideas of this Arya Samaj movement were initially most welcome. They established the first Gurukul at Kangri at Haridwar in 1901 and later opened other branches of the Gurukul system. The Gurukul at Kangadi has now acquired the status of a university. In terms of women though, this branch obviously spoke for the women to be educated and take a prominent role in the family system. But because it was opposed to the western system of education, its impact was limited on the modernization of women's lives. With the discussion of the main elements of RSMH that we just discussed, we could find out that they were interested in incorporating the best elements out of both the modernizing tradition as well as our Vedic tradition. This is one of the strengths that we found to be propounded in this particular reform movement that we all should know. Moving on to the second of the reform movement that happens to be an extension of our recently discussed movement which happens to be Brahmo Samaj. It was established on 20th of August 1828 by Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Debendranath Tagore at Calcutta is Brahmo Sabha. It was the most important reform movement of Bengal. It propagated the Vedic notion of worshipping the supreme Brahman as the only deity, disregarding all the other gods and goddesses of Hinduism. Essentially, it accepted the authority of only the Brahmin and not that of its manifestation into numerable forms. This is where this particular reform movement differs with its predecessor as in their outreach was limited to the religious institution particularly keeping as Brahmins as in the center of this reform movement. As we have discussed before, the other movements were also seen transgressing to the other sub-caste groups and to the other social structural sections of the society. But we could see from the point of view of social reform, this particular movement that is Brahmo Samaj advocated the Vedic vision of equal education of men and women, women's right to choose their marriage partner, their place in the family decision making, opposed child marriage and strongly opposed Sati through Ram Mohan's Roy's efforts. This again means that they could not of course compromise on what they thought was the at the center of this reform movement but they had some particularizing ideas that is keeping Brahmins at the center of it. When Raja Ram Mohan Roy left for England and died in 1833, Brahmo's activities dwindled a bit. Then on 6th of October 1839, Devendranath Tagore established Tatvarjani Sabha, which was soon renamed as Tatvabodhini Sabha to propagate the ideals of Ram Mohan Roy. In 1843, it was merged with Brahmo Sabha. Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar also joined it and propagated women's education along the western lines. This was in addition to the ideals of the Vedic education of the Brahmo Sabha. He also resigned in 1859 following differences from Keshav Chandra Sen and continued with his educational reforms. In 1861, we could see that Nobin Roy established Brahmo Samaj in Lahore as an extension of the ideals of Brahmo Sabha of Bengal. It had the vision to influence not just of the people from Bengal but outside the reign as well. It was applied on a much wider scale as planned before. Thus, even though it was established under a slightly different name, it was keeping value centric on the essence of a continuation of Brahmo Sabha of Bengal.
Brahmo Savaj and its precursor Brahmo Sabha were different from the Arya Samaj in the sense that they evolved the concept of Vedic education and praying to Brahma, but they did not accept the Vedas as infallible. It is important for this point to be discussed as the authority of the Vedas was not considered as something refutable. We could see that with this particular movement, the authority of the Vedas was also questioned and the weak and the various interpretations that followed that allowed us to review or that allowed us to locate the Vedas in a completely different light. They laid a strong emphasis on the Western system of modern education in addition to learning the Brahmo ideals. In their stress on Western education, they were certainly ahead of the Arya Samaj because they could modernize on the ways of propagating their ideas. They stressed certainly on scientific knowledge, rationality and Western ideals of enlightenment. Some scholars in more recent times have even said that they represented the Hindu version of missionaries activities of the West because their founders were educated in the West. This particular correlation or a corollary has an important significance because we keep remembering missionaries in the same context how they were trying to popularize their ideals, their basic systems in order to reforming the Indian society. They had a strong influence on the modernization of upper class Bengali women's life. This is to complete our discussion on Brahmo Samaj which centered along the Brahminical ideology yet they could combine their essence yet they could combine their ideas of reform along with the modernizing systems of education informing rationality and other important decisions. Next in the line we would discuss Prarthana Samaj which was founded by Atma Ram Pandurang in 1867. Later R.G. Bhandarkar a noted Sanskrit scholar and Justice Ramadev Govinda Ranade also joined it. This movement was mostly propelled by efforts of Justice Ranade. It was very similar to the Brahmo Samaj in its stress on Brahminical ideas, but of course combining the best out of modernizing movement as well. However, the addition to its ideals of its own specific characteristics is that it stressed on the teachings of 13th century Bhakti ideals, Bhakti poet saints of Maharashtra such as Tukaram, Namdev, and Vithala. They regarded their historical religious tradition as important as the stress on the teachings of the Vedas. Hence, they could also, they also extended their outreach of Vedas towards the Bhakti movement as well. Moreover, their stress was more on the social reform than on political aspects. They advocated women's education, a post-child marriage, remarriage of widows and equality of caste groups which happened to be the prime focus of this particular reform movement. It also uplifted the position of women to a considerable position particularly from the operation resulting from the operation of the subordinate or the upper caste groups. Going on to the further extension of Satya Shodak Samaj, as is evident by the name, this was a journey towards finding out new variants of truth. This was to flip the original idea of truth that was constantly being guided by age-old Brahmanical or the Puratanical beliefs. Most of the reform movements were dominated by the upper caste people of India. This scheduled caste had not taken many in much of the interest in these movements. Why we need an elaborate discussion on this particular range of movements as it just not just that transgresses the scope of these movements from the geography or from the leaders. It also focuses a shift on not just responding to the western ideals or to the European imperialism but to the people of our own country. They were trying to shift focus to the people. They were trying to bring back the analysis on our own society in order to avoid the oppression done by upper caste men and women both towards the lower caste people. In Maharashtra, the yoke of reforming the scheduled castes fell on the shoulders of 
Jyoti Rao Phule and his associates, including his wife Savitri Bai Phule. They belonged to the Mali Gardner caste. Jyoti Rao Phule was educated in a missionary school and in 1849, he started a school for the Shudra girls. He also educated his wife Savitri Bai Phule, who became his prime associate. Both of them initiated important sense of teamwork amongst their fellow caste members and it was not just limited to the caste ideology or the caste based discussions they wanted to uplift the status of women they wanted to empower women towards important directions savitri bai phule taught in the particular school that they both opened and encouraged the scheduled caste families to send their girls to school in 1873 they founded the satya shodhak samaj to free the scheduled caste from the oppression of the upper caste their ideals as discussed were different from those of the movement in that there were the other political activities as their response was certainly not limited to the british imperialism but the upper caste people of our own society they criticized the upper castes for exploiting and oppressing the scheduled caste their stress on women's education was something as a prime value on their agenda and they were pretty successful on maintaining the groundwork their activities had an awakening influence on the shudra girls lives many of them who began to get educated and came out in public life more visibly than others now there is also the discussion on the different different social reform movements from the perspective of the leaders from the perspective of the values they propagated in order to understand the full horizon of social reform movements in colonial india particularly with a focus on their impact of women we also need to understand that in which parts of india what kind of values and what kind of reform movements were initiated what what kind of qualitative influence could they bring on the lives of women and to the changes in the indian society here we tend to discuss here we move on to the discussion of the self respect movement in tamil nadu which was begun by e v ramaswamy periyar in 1925 this was a movement to raise consciousness amongst the oppressed castes of tamil nadu against the exploitation of upper caste which happened to be mostly brahmins this person this particular movement demanded entry into temples which was earlier prohibited and banned from the scheduled caste in tamil nadu although the north indian temples had opened their doors to all so this was again a region specific movement which of course went on to a great extent in order to explain the values and also it was an actionable it brought along an actionable component for the change in the rules and regulations under this particular guidance this particular movement passed major resolutions to improve the condition of women they passed the resolutions for widow remarriage women's right to property prohibition of dowry and against the institution of devdasis in tamil nadu this was all beyond the tamil nadu region movement which was particularly centered on the movement or the excess of all of the caste groups towards the temples moving on to the gender based moving on to the bright leaders from the women who make who made an important contribution towards the importance or towards bringing women out of their comfort zone and also from the subjugations of the upper caste people i welcome you all to the discussion of maharani of travancore who reigned as a regent queen for her minor nephew of travancore estate in kerala for the early 20th century in majority of the movements discussed on this topic in the history of books we find that mostly the men were engineering these movements and were passing resolutions and preaching about the upliftment of women so again why i say the perspective the lenses the prerogative of gender is important in bringing all these discussions because we need not study the reform movements just from the men who conceptualized it or for that matter the one who supposedly are described as the 
flag bearers of these reform movements. There were also important women who spearheaded the process and who made qualitative changes to the society. This particular kind of selective history that only presents men as the leader or as the prerogatives of this particular reform movements needs to be changed a bit. And of course, which presents a skewed vision of Indian society. Now we move on to the say that there were regions in India where women were not the subjects to be uplifted by men. This is again in continuation to our argument on bringing the women to the forefront. They were the rulers and decision makers but they also themselves wrote the destiny of women at some point of time. Bringing again Maharani of Travancore to the center, she was a fine example of this as the ruler. She administered her estate astutely and was widely praised for her acts. After meeting Mahatma Gandhi in 1925, she opened all the streets of Travancore for the different different caste and religious groups. She opened the first girls school and raised the women's college to the level of first grade. She was appointed as the first woman in India as the head of legislative council of Travancore. She established a committee to oversee the workings of the Travancore University. She also instituted the system of Panchayati Raj in Travancore. She invested majorly into the Cochin Harbour project which brought rich economic gains to the estate of Travancore. She also worked to bring railway and electricity to the Travancore for the first time. She also happened to be the first one opening the telephones facility for the general public and constituted a committee to inquire into the rural credit improvisations. In 1927, she redistributed 2995 acres of lands to the landless, which was a major step towards the empowerment of people. Maharani of Travancore happens to be a bright and shining example while we study the reform movements in India. They not only work to just empowering women, but they also rule the destinies of men in an astute manner. They were, and her movement, her team, was the symbol of an empowered and enlightened society, not under the guidance of men, certainly for all the times. Her narrative counteracts all images of the carefully constructed backward India being taken forward on the road of progress by when. There were several other women who contributed immensely towards reforming fellow women's life. Pandit Ramabai testified before the Education Commission in 1881 and emphasized on the need of abolishment of child marriage. She also facilitated opening of girls' educational institutes to a greater extent. In 1889, she opened the first homecoming school for the widows called Sharada Sadhan at Bombay. Ramabai Ranade presided over Seva Sadhan for the education of women. We also see Anandi Bai Joshi who worked to provide medical aid to the helpless women in India. We also see that Francina Sorabji as a prime figure to facilitate three schools for in the Bombay presidency as well. Moving on from the women's contribution towards their understanding, we also need to understand the nationalist flavor to this. We need to understand how nationalist leaders like Mahatma Gandhi played an important role, not just in the upliftment of women in a traditional sense, but he also in a literal way empowered women to take control of their lives and professionalized their services and encouraged their contribution in Indian society. He was someone who was not just another reformer who was advocating for women's education. As I told you that he had an actionable component to all his ideas and this is where he could be granted or he could be considered as a special and as a unique figure towards women empowerment. In addition to what he was doing, the reformer movement such as Ram Mohan Roy, Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, had advocated strongly the cause of women and women issues such as sati, vidori marriage and child marriage, but their influence remained regional in focus and this is an important point because they were only often raising issues that were regional in character, but their scope of the movement was not limited to the 
than India understanding. So we need to highlight the fact that Mahatma Gandhi's reign or Mahatma Gandhi's understanding of the social movements was a pan-Indian understanding. He wove together the issues related to women from across India and spoke for the women all over India. More significantly, he did not view the women as subjects to be targeted as reform by men. Rather, he viewed them as equal partners. And just because of this unique approach of his, he was able to energize all the women, all from all the parts of India, from all the caste groups, so that to form a unified movement and work towards their empowerment. Mahatma Gandhi advocated empowered position in all areas of life. In matters of education, he advocated not just to educate them but to make them self-sufficient. Similarly, he often opposed caste-based marriages and spoke for the right of women to choose their own husbands. He said, so because this was not an aspect in the larger scheme of caste opposition but because he also saw this as a means to provide a powerful position to the women who made their own decisions of life. He opposed dowry not because it was a burden on women's family but it demeaned the status of women before the men. So his range, his geographical coverage and his idea on action and on values was expanded to a much greater reign than his predecessors. He could further mobilize a lot of women across the societies in order to be self-reliant and self-independent. His worldview was radically different from that of the other social reformers, even though he was speaking about the same issues. It is easy to miss the significant difference while reading about the social reform movements because Mahatma Gandhi did not project himself as a Western influence feminist. It is important to understand his contributions in an unlight of pan-Indian ideology, how he could move on from just propagating or just talking about his ideals to the working or to maintaining or to grooming the women of the society into better informed individuals other than understanding again his unique ideas we also need to extend our understanding to the different different geographies starting from Bihar. We have some important leaders like Krishna Kumari Devi from Purnia in Bihar. She came out of Parda to address the Purnia District Congress Conference in 1921. She said in her own words that she didn't feel embarrassment at leaving her wheel and coming out to fight for independence. In fact she was even ready to sacrifice sacrifice her own family life for the sake of women empowerment. Sarla Devi of Hazari Bagh visited many areas in Chota Nagpur and addressed many more meetings in 1921. We could see the Savitri Devi, the youngest daughter of Nand Kishore and a social reformer, addressed many meetings in Patna. She condemned strongly the imperialist practices of the government and encouraged the people, both men and women, to work for the freedom struggle. We also have names of Sita Devi, wife of Raj Kishore Chaudhary and Yogmaya Devi, the wife of Rameshwar Lal Das from Darbhanga, who were freedom fighters. They donated a large parts of their lands, wore khadi and went from village to village to advocate women's education, widow remarriage, opposed child marriage, dowry, caste hierarchy and advocated an equal status of women at par with women, bringing with the daughters to become empowered and self-sufficient individuals moving on to the state of Orissa, we have Ramadevi Chaudhary who listened to Mahatma Gandhi's inspiring speech at Katak and she decided to join the freedom struggle. She began to wear khadi and encouraged all the members of her household to do so. Another in the list we find Sarla Devi, Haimviti Devi, Sarojini Devi who went from place to place to collect donations for the freedom struggle and organized meetings. Sarla Devi was imprisoned for her active part participation in the movement. Moving on to the another frontier of India which happens to be the northeast frontier, we find a large gathering was organized at Desh Bhakta Fukan's lodge under the presidentship of Mrs. Kotati. Here, Giri Vasundra, sister of Desh Bhakta Fukan and other women exhorted the people, both men and women, to join their respective movements. 
Mrs. N. K. Barua had also organized several meetings and appealed to the people to join the movement. Another ones in the list happened to be those SMS women who participated at the ground level. For example, Girija Devi, Hemant Kumari, Gyan Devi, Dhura Mainda Sundari Devi, and many others in the list. Another state to be worth finding the particular mention here was Manipur, who was amongst the last states to get colonized because of the fearless participation of Manipuri women in active politics and public space. This comes as a counter narrative to how these women in this particular region are considered to be silent or to be meek but they put up a strong voice against the ideas, against the colonization, against all the values that made them subjugated to the non-worst ideals. Understanding all these reform movements in the totality gives us an informed picture of our society. This gives us a 360 degree understanding of how these social reform movements took place and how they were looked by social and political thinkers of our country. This particular movement puts aside these kinds of movements, these kinds of empowering movements into two kinds of settings. One, which locate these kinds of movements from the perspective of the men who led it and from the other point from the women who led it and of course the qualitative changes that they were able to bring into the society. In one trend, a positive image is given to all the social reform movements in India and projects all the social reformers as having made great contributions towards the cause and the concern of women. We also see that the other kind of historiography makes a severe criticism of all the social reform movements and even paints a fainting negative picture in the grounds that these movements mostly projected the worldview of men and did not really aim at empowering the women and making them self-sufficient individuals in their own right, independent of their place in families. In order to address and in order to complete our understanding of women and social reform movements, we need to consider our understanding, we need to inform our understanding from both these positive and negative vintage points, the one who valorizes men and the second one who valorizes the kind of ideals that were propagated further. There is an urgent need to reconstruct the history not just from the perspective of men but also from the perspective of women in its complete direction. Thank you.